Hello, I'm Esther Gito Yuat. It's Monday, July 26. This is Africa 54. Mali's government says a man who tried to stab coup-leading interim president Colonel Asimi Goita has died while in police custody. 28 children in Nigeria were released from their captors Sunday after their boarding school in northern Nigeria was attacked earlier this month. Still, 81 remain in captivity as negotiations continue. Disappointing many Olympic fans, officials in Tokyo have banned spectators from attending Olympic and Paralympic Games in response to Japan's latest wave of COVID-19 infections. For VOA, Steve Ross in Tokyo has the fans' reactions. We begin our broadcast in West Africa, where the Malian government says a man who attempted to stab Mali's school leading interim president, Kano Asimi Goita, has died while in the custody of security services. David Doyle has the details. A man accused of attempting to assassinate Mali's interim president has died in hospital while in the custody of the security services, authorities have said. Colonel Asimi Goita, who has orchestrated two coups in the past year, escaped unharmed after an assailant attempted to stab him during Eid al Adha prayers at a mosque in the capital Bamako. Video showed security forces detaining a man and bundling him into the back of a pickup truck. In a statement on Sunday, the government said of the suspect, during investigations, the state of his health deteriorated. Mali was thrown into political turmoil in August last year when a military junta led by Goita toppled President Ibrahim Boubacar Keita. Goita served as vice president to transitional leader Barton Dow, who was himself then ousted in May. That was David Doyle of Reuters reporting. 28 children in Nigeria were released by their captors on Sunday. The kidnappers had raided the students' boarding school in northern Nigeria earlier this month. But the ordeal is not over. Another 81 children remain in captivity, according to a pastor involved in the negotiations for their release. The attack on the Bethel Baptist High School in the state of Kaduna was the 10th mass school kidnapping since December in northwest Nigeria carried out by Islamist militants and more recently criminal gangs. 28 children were released two days after the raid. Parents told Reuters that 180 students typically attend the school and that students were in the process of taking exams. Nigerian authorities have attributed the kidnappings to what they call armed bandits seeking ransom payments. Schools have become targets for mass kidnappings for ransom in northern Nigeria by armed groups. Such kidnappings in Nigeria were first carried out by Boko Haram and later its offshoot Islamic State West Africa province. But the tactic is now being adopted by other criminal gangs. Sierra Leone is set to become the 23rd country in Africa to abolish the death penalty. Lawmakers in the West African nation voted unanimously Friday to outlaw capital punishment and replace it with life imprisonment for a minimum 30-year sentence for such crimes as murder and treason and grant judges additional discretion when handing down a sentence. Sierra Leone has not executed anyone since 1998 when 24 soldiers were put to death by firing squad for taking part in a coup attempt the previous year. At the time, the country was in the midst of a bloody civil war that lasted from 1991 to 2002, but more than 80 people have been sent to death row since then. President Julius Mada Bio is expected to sign the legislation into law. 
Tunisian troops blocked the head of parliament from entering the building early Monday, only hours after President Kais Saeed announced he had fired Prime Minister Hichem Mechichi and suspended parliament for 30 days. Saeed's decree came after protests over the country's COVID-19 and economic situation turned violent. Saeed said he was acting in response to the country's economic woes and political deadlock and added that the country's constitution gave him that authority. The parliament speaker called the president's action a coup and says the legislature will continue its work. Two other main parties in parliament also called it a coup, which the president rejected. Saeed's announcement drew crowds of demonstrators into the streets of Tunis and elsewhere to celebrate. There were also protests outside the parliament building and some clashes between the opposing groups. Tunisia has struggled economically for years and along with political dysfunction, it has dealt with a spike in COVID-19 cases and deaths. Somalia's long-delayed electoral process failed again to take place on Sunday as scheduled. Sunday should have been the start of the Senate or Upper House election, followed by the election of the Lower House MPs in September and the presidential election in October this year. Abdi Razak Omar Mohammed, a Somali member of parliament and former security minister, says some issues that needed to be resolved to make Sunday's election possible were not including managing the election of MPs representing Somaliland in the federal parliament of Somalia and financing. Mohammed told VOS James Batty the international community and donors have not agreed on finances for the election. South Sudan has made history when President Salva Kiir nominated the nation's first female speaker of the Transitional National Legislative Assembly. The nomination of Jema Nunu Kumba as Speaker of Parliament means that a woman is leading one of the three pillars of the government. Kumba was Secretary General of the Sudan People's Liberation Movement and Governor of Western Equatorial State. South Sudan women's activist groups have long demanded that women be appointed to important government positions because of the role women played in South Sudan's independence struggle. Slain Haitian President Jovenel Moise has been laid to rest in the northern port city of Cape Haitian. Moise was gunned down in his home in Port-au-Prince on July 7. The assassination underscored the continuing influence of foreign actors in the Western Hemisphere's poorest country. Here is Laura Bowman has our story. The body of slain Haitian President Jovenel Moise was laid to rest in a private funeral in his hometown on Friday. Security was tight following violent protests and instability in the Caribbean nation. Moise was gunned down in his Port-au-Prince home on July 7th. The late president's wife spoke publicly for the first time since the attack in which she was wounded. Blood will not cease to flow. Today, it is Jovenel Moise. Tomorrow, who will it be? It will be him, it will be me, it will be us. Those accused in the assassination plot include Haitian Americans and former Colombian soldiers, highlighting ongoing foreign involvement in Haiti. The funeral at the family's seaside property comes just days after a new prime minister was installed. Ariel Henry was designated prime minister by Moise, but never sworn in. He replaced interim prime minister Claude Joseph and has promised to form a provisional consensus government until elections are held. On Friday, foreign dignitaries from the U.S. and elsewhere flew in to pay their respects. Rest in peace, sweetheart. Rest with the feeling of duty accomplished. Let your soul rest in peace. We will take care of the rest. The new prime minister confronts decades of political instability in the world's first black-led republic. Laurel Bowman, VOA News, Washington. After much lobbying, Australia's Great Barrier Reef will not appear on a list of endangered world heritage sites. Environmentalists call this a terrible decision fueled by political pressure. VOA's Arashar Basadi explains. Scientists and environmental activists have for years called for greater protections for Australia's Great Barrier Reef, but on Friday, the United Nations World Heritage Committee declined to declare the reef in danger. 
Greenpeace Australia Pacific's chief executive officer, David Ritter, tells the Reuters news agency the move is a mistake. UNESCO's decision was a terrible missed opportunity to uh, shine a light on the grave danger that our Great Barrier Reef is in and to begin the fight back for the reef, which can only start with the Australian government taking decisive action to reduce our contribution to climate change. UNESCO recently recommended the in danger classification, but Australian officials launched an intensive lobbying campaign against it. A UN panel agreed late last week to defer the vote until next year. Ritter says special interests won the day. It is difficult to imagine how much more in danger the reef could be. So very clearly, it is vested interest agendas that have triumphed here, not science, not common sense, and not the best interests of the Great Barrier Reef. Australia relies on coal-fired power and per capita as among the world's top carbon emitters. Its conservative government says defending coal is necessary to defend coal jobs. Terry Hughes is the director of the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence for Coral Reef Studies. Hughes tells Reuters he disagrees with the government's thinking. The Australian government is maintaining that uh, keeping the Barrier Reef off the UNESCO in danger list will protect reef tourism. I don't think that's true. Uh, the real threat to reef tourism is Australia's love affair with fossil fuels. The Australian Environment Minister Susan Lay said in a statement the Great Barrier Reef is quote the best managed reef in the world and pointed to the government's three billion dollar investment in its protection. But experts worry that won't be enough to safeguard the biodiversity they say is severely imperiled. Scientists say if coral reefs collapse, it could trigger a catastrophic chain of events leaving a quarter of the world's marine life without their habitats. Arash Arabasadi, VOA News. A Somali-American fashion designer is launching a line of headscarves with a major North American retailer to give Muslim women more options and to make hijabs more visible to U.S. shoppers. For VOA, Somalia's Maksamud Maskade has our story from the Midwest state of Minnesota, narrated by Radia Adam. Shoppers at this Nordstrom department store in Minneapolis have some new choices with the addition of headscarves from the local Somali-American design firm, Henna and Hijabs. CEO Hilal Ibrahim says Muslim women are underrepresented in U.S. retail. So this partnership is really special. We work together to create um, pieces um, in this collection that will uh, be sold in stores across the country and in Canada. Um, and my hope is that uh, young Muslim women and girls will be able to walk into Nordstrom stores and now purchase their full outfit, including their hijab as well. Ibrahim started selling hijabs at a local hospital gift shop when she saw some patients had to cover their heads with blankets. Partnering with her firm on this line of silk, cotton and chiffon hijabs is just the opportunity Nordstrom was looking for, says the company's senior director of diversity, Mohammed Omar. The work here with Hen and Hijab and Halal Ibrahim really exemplifies the work that we've been going after for some time and helping to bring product lines to different segments of the market that have been untouched before. Ibrahim says partnering with Nordstrom helps make hijab a more visible part of American culture. As a Somali Muslim American woman, it, it, it showcases that it's okay. Hijabs are normal. It's a part of American culture, and um, I want to normalize that. I want people to come into stores and see hijabs and say, that is just as American as wearing a T-shirt. Nordstrom says Ibrahim's hijab collection is available online and in 16 stores across North America. For Mahmoud Masade in Minneapolis, Razia Adam, VOA News, Washington, D.C. A new generation of photojournalists and visual storytellers is emerging and through its lens is changing the narrative across Africa. Alexander Joe has been a photographer since 1975, covering 13 countries on the continent for Asians France Press. After retiring, he now focuses on social documentary photography. We get more in this self-narrated report produced by VOA's Betty Ayub.
Alexander Joe. I'm a retired photographer and living in Madagascar for the past 12 years. I started my photography career in black and white. And yes, the world is color, but the black and white picture is spectacular. Saturday morning, my wife and I were come back from town and we saw this couple celebrating the wedding. And unlike most places today where people want all this pomp and glory, this couple and the rest of the party just took a stroll down the street, greeting everybody, people congratulating them, and it's just a lovely sight. A little village I live in, not many people have run in the water. So two times a week you get women going to the canal and uh, washing. So a lot of people fish in the canal for personal consumption and sell in the market. In there in particular, you'll get two sisters who are fishing. They went fishing early in the morning before going to school. They'd fish for, uh, for crayfish, take them to the family, the family take them to the market and the girls would go to school. In my work, I have a soft spot for children and women. One of my pictures I'm very fond of, there's a grandmother who was crayfishing, and all the children behind her are her great-grandchildren, and the grandchildren are looking after great-grandchildren, watching grandmother fishing. Rice farming is an important thing in Madagascar. Almost every family has its own piece of land where well, they'll cultivate the rice. It's a whole family thing. In fact, you'll see there's a child there who's walking, looking backwards on his way to go and help the family do the rice harvest. His friends were playing football a little further back, and I'm sure he was dying to go and play with his friends football, but he had his family duties to go and do, help harvest the rice. There's a group of women walking along the canal. This group of six women, their husbands had gone to another province looking for work. So this group worked as a team, uh, as I call them, powerful women. I've always told friends that I was born a little too late in time because I loved the pictures taken from 50s, 60s and so forth. And then I came to Madagascar and the pictures I've been longing to take I found here, so I have a daily life of richness in pictures every day. Let us know what you think about Africa 54. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also, check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come, why fans are being banned from the Olympic and Paralympic Games. Stay with us. Next on Straight Talk Africa, we'll take an in-depth look at the youth-led social uprisings we've seen across Africa in recent years. As young people take to the streets and social media to demand change, we ask, have they been effective? And what have the mass uprisings really accomplished? Join me, Heidi Adams, on the next Straight Talk Africa. Welcome back to Africa 54. This appears to be a crucial week for a bipartisan plan to fix America's languishing infrastructure. Viewers Michelle Quinn reports. The effort to upgrade America's roads, bridges, and broadband networks may get a boost this week if a $1.2 trillion bipartisan infrastructure agreement advances. The Senate could vote to open debate. But details are still being worked out by a group of Republican and Democratic senators on issues that include public transit spending. A 
Ohio Senator Rob Portman, the lead Republican negotiator of the bipartisan group, said the package represents a rare moment to show that the two political parties can compromise to get things done. So it's, it's the right thing to do for the country, uh, most importantly, uh, but it's also something that has been the, uh, the subject of a bipartisan consensus finding process, which we ought to do more of in this town. Once it is ready, the bipartisan package will face a challenge for passage. With 60 votes needed, the deal's success relies on some Republican senators joining in the evenly divided Senate. Proponents can't afford to lose a single vote, but some want the smaller bipartisan package to be tied to a separate $3.5 trillion initiative that focuses on human infrastructure. That includes child care, education, and climate change provisions. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, a Democrat, said she will bring the bipartisan infrastructure measure to the House floor only when the Senate passes that bigger package. The Senate can do that, she said, through a process known as reconciliation, a way to enact legislation on taxes, spending, and other financial measures with only a simple majority required in that chamber. The president has said uh, that he wants to have a bipartisan bill, and we all do. But that is not the limitation of the vision of the president. He wants to build back better. He wants to do so in a way uh, that, again, uh, involves many more people in the prosperity uh, of our country. The health of America's infrastructure has long been ranked behind those of other developed nations. The dueling packages are a test for elected leaders, including President Joe Biden, a Democrat, over whether the two parties can come together to get things done. Both chambers have a short window to do so before recessing in August. Michelle Quinn, VOA News. Afghan lawmakers are asking the United States to continue to provide urgently needed maintenance and logistical support for their Air Force and National Armed Forces after the U.S. military completes its withdrawal in September. The White House is pledging continued support but stopped short of promising continued maintenance or drone strikes on Taliban equipment. VOA senior diplomatic correspondent Cindy Sain reports. Amid ongoing violence in Afghanistan, including rockets landing near the presidential palace during prayers this week, the Taliban are calling for President Ashraf Ghani to step down as a condition for any negotiated political settlement. Asked about the comments Friday, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki had this to say. First, the president and the administration supports the leadership of the Afghan people, uh, including Ashraf Ghani. Uh, the president was scheduled to speak with him today, I believe, uh, and I don't believe there's a readout that's come out about that call quite yet. It may while we're speaking here. Uh, I would note that uh, there are ongoing uh, political negotiations and discussions that we certainly support between Afghan leaders, members of the Afghan uh, government, and the Taliban. And we believe a political solution is the only outcome to lasting peace in Afghanistan. Uh, but we will continue to provide support to the government in the form of humanitarian support, security support, uh, training, uh, and uh, we will also continue to encourage them to take a leading role in defending and protecting their own people. Earlier this week at the Pentagon, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, gave this candid assessment of Afghanistan's uncertain future. There's a possibility of a negotiated outcome that's still out there. Uh, there's a possibility of a complete Taliban takeover or a possibility of any number of other scenarios, breakdowns, warlordism, all kinds of other scenarios that are out there. We're monitoring very closely. Uh, I don't think uh, the end game is yet written. In a Zoom call with U.S. journalists Friday that was not recorded, Several leading members of the Afghan parliament urgently called on the United States to continue providing critical funding, logistical support, and maintenance help for their security forces and air force, saying one-third of their planes are grounded due to maintenance issues. They also asked for more U.S. drones to attack Taliban equipment. Afghan lawmakers said the problems would only get worse after U.S. forces depart in September. Cindy Sane, VOA News.
to the disappointment of many Olympic fans, spectators are being banned from attending Olympic and Paralympic Games in Tokyo in response to Japan's latest wave of COVID-19 infections. Steve Ross has reaction from Tokyo. The Games of the 32nd Olympiad in 2020 are awarded to the city of Tokyo. Yeah! Joy from the Japanese delegation when the International Olympics Committee announced Tokyo had been picked to host the 2020 Olympics. Brand new sports venues, including a new national stadium, were built in anticipation of throngs of Olympic visitors. Officials saw the Games as an opportunity to promote the country's growing tourism industry and showcase omotenashi, Japanese-style hospitality. But the COVID-19 pandemic disrupted plans. The games were postponed a year, and in March, international spectators were banned. Earlier this month, in the face of rising infections, officials banned nearly all domestic spectators, too. I think the, the reaction from the Japanese people, they haven't been supportive of the one-year postponement. And this has been ongoing for months, and there's been a lack of enthusiasm. Professor of Public Diplomacy at Kyoto University of Foreign Studies, Nancy Snow, says athletes may be affected by competing in venues without spectators. This will impact the athletes. They're human beings. They're exceptionally talented, but they're still human beings. They have emotions, and they're going to feel that. You got to have fans for the Olympics. You got to have that build up. You got to have the cheering. Even after years of promotion for the Tokyo Olympics, areas like the Asakusa District and Nakamise Dori Market aren't filled with tourists like they were before the pandemic. Visitors are sparse and local vendors are hurting, like Mika Soka Hanaishi, who teaches tea ceremony fundamentals. I already lost 80% of the sales since uh, last year. But uh, obviously, I was expecting getting more, uh, you know, the time that the Olympics was open. Despite their apprehensions about hosting the Olympics, the decision to forbid almost all spectators is seen by many Japanese residents as regrettable, even if necessary. In terms of preventing spread of the pandemic, I think the choice to forbid spectators was the only way to open the Olympics. <laughs> Well, live performances are held with large audiences, so I think it's a little sad that no spectators will be allowed at the Olympics. If these Olympics succeed, I think Japan's reputation will rise, but I wonder how much economic effect it will have because we will have spent more money by then. I think we won't know whether it's good or bad until it's over. Steve Ross for VOA News, Tokyo. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, we thank you for watching.